Hello. Um, like Tommy said, my name is Elizabeth. I am the co-executive director at Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. And since the year 2000, we have been serving as a hub of wildfire preparedness information and research and community support programs. And um, this presentation is really focused on what you can do around your home and yard to be wildfire ready. And it follows the National Ready, Set, Go framework, but it's been adapted to be specific for Hawaii. So I'm just gonna dive right in. There are a lot of slides. Um, this is just a little bit about our organization. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We are not an agency, but we work really tightly with partners across the state. All of our fire departments, all of our civil defense and emergency management agencies, um, private partners, community partners, watershed partnerships. There's just a lot of us working together on wildfire preparedness, and so we are a hub of all that activity. And we depend on donations and competitive grants to be funded to do our work. And over the years, you know, we were founded in the year 2000, and so we've had kind of a 23-year head start on developing programs and trainings and resources and fire science. And now um, we're excited that there's so much interest in, in learning about what exists already. And um, Ready, Set, Go is a big part of it. So before I get started, I just can talk to you a little bit about the Fireways Communities Program. It's a neighborhood preparedness program where neighbors come together to take action and to mitigate their fire risk and to do um, some education within their neighborhood and also to do some projects to reduce fire risk. And it's a really cool, growing program. We had, prior to August, we had 16 communities and by the end of this year, we'll probably have 60. And so it's just been this massive interest and we welcome that. So if you're interested in being a part of the Fireways program or you have some neighbors who want to get together and take action, you can reach out at any time and we'll, we'll get you started in that program. In case you have to leave early or you just want the highlights already, um, some details, some takeaways that you can think about for wildfire before we even dive into all the details are these, which is that Hawaii is a fire prone state um, it takes everybody to get safe, to get ready, be prepared, reduce fire risk. And fire is unique in that there's a lot you can do ahead of time. It's much different than hurricanes and other hazards where we really don't have any say. Fires can only travel where there's something to burn. And you can actually manipulate the landscape. You can address your landscaping around your, home, your yard. There's a lot you can do to get more safe and to make it so that fire won't burn across and harm your property and your structures and so that's what the race that go program is focused on it's all those detailed activities that you can do to stay fire safe and there are programs resources trainings modules online things like if you're interested the world is your oyster because we've developed a lot of that and so that's all on our website and we welcome you to go use any of those resources I put a few slides in here about some background of fire, wildfire in Hawaii, just so we all have that same foundational context of understanding, which is that Hawaii is fire prone, and it's really because we have a combination of factors involved in, um, in the level of risk that we see. So what you see in terms of wildfire risk, any place, whether they have a lot of it or they don't, has everything to do with um, what people are doing, what the weather and climate are like, and also what kind of combustible materials or vegetation are there. And in Hawaii, we have increases in all of these. We have increased human-caused ignitions. We have a weather cycle where it, we have these big rains and green-up events, and then it dries out. And then we have really combustible grasses and vegetation and even homes and towns. And so in Hawaii, we just have this recipe for increasing wildfire risk. The simple way to tell the story that we're really trying to get out there is that we have a lot of risk, Hawaii and the Pacific, Western Pacific, Guam, Palau, Micronesia, you name it, are all experiencing increased wildfire risk. And it has to do with the fact that we have human-caused ignitions. We know in Hawaii it's caused a lot by human activities. Almost 99% of our fires are started by people. It's campfires, barbecues fireworks, vehicles, and even small hand tools like welders and grinders that are starting um, fire, the majority of our wildfires. So this is all preventable if we're just more careful with our activities that spark. 
But when fires ignite, they can spread across dry grasses, unmanaged lands, unmanaged vegetation, and then hit subdivisions and communities and threaten lives, homes, structures, you name it. And so there's work to do in each of these areas. We have to prevent ignitions, we have to deal with our vegetation, we have to make our homes and towns safer. So the Ready, Set, Go um, program focuses a lot on the, on the, the built environment, our homes, and um, our neighborhoods. But just really quickly to sort of um, bust some myths, we have been tracking wildfire occurrence across the state for years, and we know wildfires are happening on both sides of every island, Malcolm Mackay, um, every island in the state. So we have wildfires occurring that require a firefighting response happening all over the place. So it is not true to say only the dry sides burn or that I don't have to worry about wildfire because I live on the wet side or I live somewhere where it rains a lot. We are seeing fires all over the place. Now where they get big is largely a result of the conditions, the kind of vegetation, if it's dry, what the weather's doing, if there's big wind or not. But we do have ignitions happening everywhere and under the right conditions anywhere can burn. So wildfire preparedness is really for all of us to take part in. It actually matters that everybody's safe and we're seeing more and more fires happen on the wet sides. So, um, we want to encourage everybody to, to learn about this and take action. So the things that we can do, we can reduce ignitions, we can manage our lands and manage our vegetative fuels, we can make our homes and towns safer and more um, uh, ignition resistant, meaning if embers come and land, they're not going to start fire, new fires. And we can be ready with evacuation plans. And so there's so many materials over in the other room and also in our Ready, Set, Go guide that you can find at our table in there that talks about good evacuation planning. So now I'm gonna dive in. If you, I didn't bring any of these over here, but they're on our table in the other room. There's the Ready, Set, Go action guide. But everything that is in there, I'm just presenting some highlights on today. And it's really about, um, uh, the actions you can take personally, but we also have the community level actions. We have lots of other things you could do if, if you want to get prepared, but today we're just gonna focus on your home and your family. So the first part of Ready, Set, Go. Ready is the most um, detailed part. There's the most to do on the ready portion. Set and go are really quick to talk about. They're equally important, but ready is really where the magic's at. So this is where I'm gonna spend the bulk of my presentation today. So Ready has three parts. The first part is creating defensible space around your home, and what that means is a house that can be defended from fire and re resist ignition. Um, that has a lot to do with your yard work, and so defensible space is really focusing on creating and clearing your man and managing your vegetation and your landscaping so that it doesn't burn as readily. And then we'll get into the, the other two portions, hard in your home and evacuation planning in a minute, but I'm gonna talk about the defensible space piece. The idea here, and these are a little bit blurry um, maybe, but um, the idea here is that when you've done your defensible space work and you've managed with good housekeeping your vegetation around your home and yard, that house can survive a fire oftentimes on its own. And, um, you can see here on the left side picture, there's a big driveway. I mean, this isn't in Hawaii. We didn't want, for sensitivity reasons, we're not using any Hawaii devastation pictures, but they exist at this point. Um, but you know, if they have lean, clean, and green landscaping, they have short grass, it's hydrated, there's good access for fire service on the left side, and you can see that that prepared house did survive, and all that black area around it burned. So it burned right up to it, but because of the measures they had in place, it didn't ignite. But on the right side, this is a picture from Santa Rosa, California, but everything burned. You can see that there was vegetation in between the homes. It wasn't clear. There wasn't good spacing. Um, all of those ash areas are used to be homes. And so depending on how you organize your space, your landscaping, etc., that's going to affect how fire travels through the area. And so those are the kinds of things we want to interrupt so that fire just doesn't have an easy path to go burn everything. So part of this, um, in terms of getting ready, has requires you to understand how fire works. And wildfires travel in three ways, or fires travel in three ways. A lot of people think fires just travel across the land in a steady flow and just only move in that way. But a lot of wildfire 
damage and additional ignitions happen because of embers. So we have direct flame contact, especially if you picture if you live somewhere where you're at the edge of undeveloped lands, the wildfire can come and those edge homes are at risk from direct flame contact, but most of the time, communities burn because of embers, because the wind is blowing and those embers blow in the wind. And we know here, we have documentation of embers blowing miles and then they land and wherever they land, you don't want them to land in something that's readily burnable. So when it lands in leaf piles or dead and dying vegetation or a pet bed or something that's combustible, that can ignite and then it ignites the things around it. And that's why the wildland fires can turn into what's called urban conflagrations where there's just a bunch of homes burning and it's more of like a neighborhood fire and it's because of embers. So the Ready, Set, Go program focuses a lot on thinking through how you can make your home and yard ember resistant. Um, but also even just really, really extremely heated air can ignite things on fire as well. So when you're dealing with fire prevention and mitigation and you're working through how you're gonna make your home and yard safe, you have to think through all of these things. It's not just you know only the edge homes next to the wildland area are at risk. Everybody's at risk from all of these things. And once you have a few houses going, they ignite the other houses, they send more embers, etc. So you're really trying to interrupt um, fire's ability to impact your home and yard. And the more homes that are ignition resistant in a neighborhood, the more safe the whole neighborhood is. Because if one fire starts six more houses, that starts 36 more, everyone that doesn't burn is actually keeping the whole neighborhood safer. So when you're thinking about how to be ready and create defensible space, you wanna start close to your home and start working your way out. We talk about doing it in zones and we wanna start closest to your home because when they have um, experiments done in these giant warehouses where they actually burn homes, they put homes with different materials that are commonly used and they, they fire embers at them with a big fan and they see what ignites. And the most impactful actions that you can take to protect your home from burning is from zero to five foot out in that perimeter of your home. And then you can, so we say take action there first and then move um, on your way out. So some tips on creating that defensible space. We want you to keep thinking about those embers and where they can land. So you wanna think through on your roof if you have nooks and crannies where leaves are piling up. You wanna make sure that regularly you're clearing those out. Your, your rain gutters might have dead and dying debris or leaf litter in there. You wanna clear that out. Um, a lot of folks are on post and pier and you have embers that can go under your house and you don't want anything under there that's gonna be combustible. You wanna clear that out. If you have propane tanks, clean around them. Um, lots, of, lots of people have been putting gravel from the zero to five feet area or hardening in it or putting concrete. Um, we don't say have no vegetation, that's not it. But if you do have vegetation, you need to clear and maintain and make sure there's nothing dead or dying um, around that vegetation. So ideally you would have from zero to five feet combustible free. So nothing that's gonna burn in that. That's where you can really, you know, close to guarantee that nothing's gonna burn is if, it's, if that is all the way clear. But I know people really like their plants and so it's just really being careful that you're maintaining all the time. And if you are gonna have small, low growing plants around your home, try not to put them under windows because if you have dead leaves, those ignite, it burns the bush, the bush gets really hot, it cracks the window, the embers go inside, and then your house burns. And so this is why we make the recommendations we do is because you can really optimize your protection if you take these kind of actions in the zero to five feet areas. And I talked about this hardscaping, using gravel, using pavers, whatever you want, but just to kind of minimize what's combustible in that zone. And um, make sure that any plants you do have are green, they're hydrated, they're, they're low lying, and ideally they would be um, drought tolerant so that if they don't get the water they need, they're not gonna drop all their leaves and require you to have to go clean them all up. And as you work your way out, um, you can relocate things just outside of that um, zero to five foot boundary with a lot more safety. So if you have storage, 
if you have compost, if you have wood piles, if you have things like that, just get them away from your house as far out as you can. And you want to think through, if you have like a wooden fence around your house, that last five or 10 feet that then goes straight into your house on your side yard, if you can replace that with metal or rock or something else, that's, that helps to not have just a wick that takes the fire straight to your house. So you want to replace anything that's right touching your house with something that's non-combustible. And then again on your landscaping, we say keep your grass short, keep your trees limbed up high. What you really want to do is remove fire's ability to travel across the, the ground and grass and go all the way, um, just climb into the bush, into the tree, and then get up high. You want to keep it really low. And then again, remove all dead and dying branches. And think through making sure that your roof isn't being touched by vegetation as well. And I talked about those, the, Technically, they're called ladder fuels. When you have high grass that then can um, touch low hanging branches and the fire can just get up high because it's really hard to put out a fire that's happening up high and then it's sending more embers in the wind. It's really easy to put out a fire that's just slow and moving along the ground. So we try to keep the fires as low as possible to just minimize impact. And then as you start to work your way out, you want to think through things like do you have your, is your house labeled with an address marker? Are your, you know, are, are, is there good emergency access? If the fire department or ambulance or anybody needs to access your home and you make a call, can they get in there? Do you have a gate? Does it open? Is your address clearly written or, you know, posted outside your home? You just want to think through how to make it easy to respond to your house. Um, there's a lot more detail, but those are some like really good tips at least to get started. The next part is hardening your home and making sure that it's as ignition resistant and non-combustible as possible. So the idea is just thinking through all of those vulnerable places. So you have, for instance, vents across at the top where birds get in. You want to make sure that those are screened because you want, if embers are flying through the air, you don't want them to go into your attic and then burn something inside. You want to block its access. If you're on post and pier, you can put screen around the bottom so the embers can't go under your house. So you just want to block all those places where embers would be getting in. Um, and then clearing and cleaning out the places that there might be accumulated leaf debris and other types of materials like that. So um, this is an example of a house on one side where all of those things are not taken care of in one side where all of them are. And we don't have the live video on here, but this is literally the way they build the homes in those fire science warehouses where they're testing all the materials. And this is what they've landed on in terms of what's dangerous and what's not. So we wanna close our eaves, we wanna have fiber cement boards or hardy board instead of wood shingle or you know wood siding, et cetera. And also if you have lanai's or decks or anything like that, it's better if they're not wood, and, it, and if they are, you need to be maintaining all that vegetation to make sure that you don't have anything that would ignite and burn long enough to then ignite the wood and then carry that into the house. So this is the, um, this is the video that I'm not gonna play, but essentially this is the one that shows that when it's getting an ember attack uh, on the house, the right side doesn't burn and the left side does, and it's just a really good visual to see that that really happens. So I'm gonna skip that. So the final thing is just making and practicing an evacuation plan. This is a really important piece of being ready and thinking about evacuation way before it ever happens is the way to make sure that if you do have to evacuate, you have everything in place, it happens smoothly, it's not super stressful, um, and this is all part of being ready. So you'll see in the Ready, Set, Go guide, if you grab one from the table if you haven't already, that there's a whole list that helps you get evacuation ready and to be prepared in case evacuation is necessary. The idea here, though, is that you're getting everything ready ahead of time so that if there is a fire, you can leave early. And that ends up being the go portion of the Ready, Set, Go program. But you'll see that there's a whole planning guide. You can think through who you want to contact, who you need to be ready to um, communicate with, where everybody is at different times of day, if you have kids in school, et cetera. But there's a really good way to think it through, and we have that in the Ready, Set, Go guide. So I encourage you to do that. You can take it out, you can put it on your fridge, somewhere, somewhere um, handy um, so that you see it all the time. 
And of course, just like everybody, we're encouraging you to have a go bag ready. And that the idea is you have your glasses and prescription and a change of clothes and some basics because a lot of times, different than a hurricane where we have days notice, sometimes your wildfire evacuation might be minutes to an hour, maybe a day, but most of the time it's really fast. And that's not the time to run around and mow your yard and do all those things trying to make your house safe. You wanna have that, you wanna live like that where that's always done and it's just part of your regular maintenance. And the only thing you have to do is grab your go bag and maybe a few last minute things like your toothbrush and you run. So having a go bag ready is really important. Um, before I move on to set, I did wanna encourage you to, uh, I did wanna encourage you to um, reach out to your neighbors because a lot of times we have neighbors who are mobility challenged or they don't have cars or they can't do their yard work or whatever else and so it really needs to be a community thing where we're taking care of each other and we're also ready for evacuation and we can scoop them up into our plans and into our practicing anybody who needs additional assistance and we have that ready ahead of time so that's ready that's the most that's the most intensive part of the ready set go program but set is just maintaining situational awareness it's about, what that means is you're paying attention. And you should be paying attention in two different ways. The first one is seasonally. So notice when things are drying out. Notice if it's a period of drought. Pay attention to the conditions and just know that fire risk is higher when it's windy, when it's drier, when it's been dry for a while. And just have that kind of, oh, I better get my go bag ready. I better be doing my yard maintenance. Allow that to inspire you to take action. But that's more like, long-term, seasonally, just always paying attention to that. The second part is during a fire event, stay informed, stay, you know, sign up for civil defense alerts, make sure you're looking at trusted information, pay attention to what's happening, and if you happen to live in an area that is more prone to wildfires, you'll, um, it's, it's really important to know that fires, their behavior changes fast. So it might look like it's far away and it's going the other direction, but very quickly the wind can change and it can come a different direction. And so we just encourage everybody to be paying attention to the formal communications and also to what's actually happening. So look for smoke, smell, do you smell smoke? Do you see it? Do you feel that spidey sense of something's not quite normal and you're a little nervous and pay attention to all of that. And then go. So the go part of the program is leaving early. So we, you, don't wait necessarily for an evacuation notice or to have somebody knock on your door and escort you out. We just don't have the personnel for that. So you can always go back home if you leave early, but just get out of Dodge and you had your, with a piece of knowing your house and yard are ready, you had your go bag, your communication plans in place, you just go, you can go to dinner, you can go to the beach, you can go to the movies, whatever. And you can always go back home, but at least you're not a part of evacuation traffic and you're out far in advance of, um, of any dangerous situation. So plan to leave early, plan to take your bag and have that somewhere accessible. This is not the time to be running around trying to do everything we just talked about. It's the time to go, and you just go. And think through ahead of time your route planning. Where might you go? Where are your decision points? Which way would you go under which circumstances? Um, which resources, hotels, friends? food are in which directions and ideally which way would you like to go but what are you going to do if it's blocked what are you going to do if the fire's on that side but think it through like actually map out your course and how you would make that happen both through vehicles and if you had to walk if you had to ride a bike if you had to catch a ride whatever it is but think through what that would actually be like and this is why we recommend to practice and think through where you would go so you want to have options you know there are uh, oftentimes or always during evacuation events there are shelters that open up but maybe you can pre-arrange to stay with a friend or family member if that ever happens or you would have to make a reservation at a hotel but those are all part of the evacuation planning that you want to have done ahead of time and um, I don't know if you can catch it there but of course maybe Talmadge can talk about the civil defense alerts but sign up for these because that's where you're gonna get the most trusted information And don't forget that we said to leave early. Don't wait wondering, you know, are they gonna evacuate us? If you're that worried, you can just leave. You don't have to wait, because that's, that's the hardest part. Evacuations are really hard to, um, 
to decide that it's time to do it from the agency point of view. Because you have to think about all the things, there's a lot of considerations. Because if we evacuate too often, people start ignoring it. If you are told to evacuate, people have medical incidents, they're scared, they trip and fall, they have strokes and heart attacks. It's like, you know, it's, there's a sweet spot of when you evacuate and it's worth it and it doesn't put other incidents, um, make other incidents happen. So it's like a hard decision and they're, 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 everybody's doing their best. But you don't have to wait for that. You can just go early and you can just be um, safe no matter what and go back home if it was nothing. So, oh, there was one last piece too, which is when you evacuate late, sometimes you'll become a search and rescue and then instead of firefighters fighting the fire, now they have to go look for you, they have to help you out because now you're in a dangerous situation. And when you leave early, you open up the roads to allow emergency responders to get in. And then they don't, you know, so there's a lot of important reasons to, to leave early in addition to just your own safety, but also just to the actual firefighting and response effort. So with that, that is the entire, those are the highlights of the Ready, Set, Go um, action planning guide. And I should have started it this way, but our national level and Hawaii level of fire managers decided to embrace this program and to set it up this way with this idea of leaving early out of lessons that, of things that went wrong with some mega fires in Australia where their practice was to have everybody firewise around their homes and yards with good defensible space and um, stay and defend. But some fires are so severe, the behavior of the fire is so severe, they get so big, they travel so quickly that that is not always the safest practice. And so the so International Association of Firefighters and our US and Hawaii fire managers decided let's adopt this and encourage people to get out early. Um, because that is actually the guarantee of safety instead of, you know, hedging our bets. So we're all better when everybody does their parts. There's a lot of resources on the table. You can look at our website. There's a lot of information to help you get prepared. And our organization is here to support you too. So you can email us, you can call. We're um, a small team, but we really try to be responsive and help everybody get safe. So with that, um, the time is now. If it ever wasn't before, I think a lot of people are aware that there's a need to be wildfire safe. So let us know how we can help you. And I hope after this, you'll go home and do some yard work and take some action and be safer. That's it. Yeah, do you have any, any questions? Yeah. Do you have people that go into the community people in your neighborhood to be vested Yeah, so um, the question was if we have people that go into neighborhoods to help folks get prepared. So we have our Firewise Communities Program where we have, you know, we have staff that actually will come and walk around with a group of neighbors and do an assessment and figure out what kind of fire risks you have. And then the neighborhood makes an action plan and you, you get going on your work, but it's technically sound and it's advised by usually fire department and forestry and wildlife and our organization and we invite other partners to come. And so we all make that plan together and then the community themselves, the neighbors decide what they're gonna do. Um, and that's the fire waste program and that's, that's a big part of what we wanna do is help neighborhoods get safe. So, um, you can come to the table if you want, but also you could just look up hawaiiwildfire.org and it's like Firewise is a big part of what we do. We want to help with that. And then a part of that program is that for folks who live in those Firewise communities, we offer free home assessments for individual homes where we'll do a, an hour-long educational walk around and look at risk and assess that and give the homeowners some tips on, uh, on what they can do themselves to get prepared. Well, thank you. And maybe, Thomas, can you follow up on um, the sign up for Everbridge? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Always great to have HWMO MO as a partner. So, Elizabeth was talking about the um, alerts for Hawaii County. The brochure on the back it has got the information and the QR code to help you sign up. Um, I caution you to choose the the hazard that affects you. Don't, don't sign up for all, all of them. Um, and choose uh, 
a primary method. Don't choose them all as well because you're going to be calling my office and saying, take me off of these things because I'm getting every alert and every which way and it's too much. So grab that brochure. It's got that information on it. Thanks, and that concludes our presentation process or, or um, episode for this uh, event. I thank you guys for being part of it and for coming to do today's uh, disaster fair.